remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. And I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This ends the reading of God's Word. Well, sometimes in years past, when we come to the first Sunday of Advent, I break from whatever series that we're going through, whatever book we're studying, and we do a, an Advent series. And we will do an Advent series. It's going to be a little shorter this year than the past because I want to get through these seven letters and focus on seven great themes in Christ's preaching as the risen and exalted Lord. Going back to the beginning of these seven letters, because this is, after all, the, the fifth one, I want us to think about how these letters to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3 are the words of Christ, the exalted and risen Lord, to his churches. Every one of them begins with an address to the church to be given to the messenger or the angel of that church. And they are described as the words of him who... And then there's an explicit reference back to the picture of Jesus Christ we see in Revelation chapter 1 as the risen Lord, the one who holds the stars in his hand and stands among the lampstands. He is the God, the Lord, Christ, the Messiah, who is in his churches and empowers, invigorates, and commands them, who calls them, who protects them, who loves them. And as we've looked at this, we've taken what I've called a horizontal view to these messages of Christ to look at what his great passions are, what his commitments are as the preacher to his church. We see that in every one of these letters, Jesus begins by saying, I know you. And he wants every one of his churches to know that he knows us. He knows our strengths and our weaknesses. He knows our context. He knows where we live. He knows our heartaches. He knows our tribulations. He knows everything about us. And that is so vital for us to remember. Not only does he know all of the challenges you face, he knows all of the failures you have embraced. And he nonetheless says to people like you and me, come, turn, repent, live, conquer. You see, the other themes we've looked at include the fact that we don't know ourselves nearly as well as he does. All of the churches who have reference made to what they think of themselves are exactly, diametrically, polarly wrong. They think they're this, but in reality, they're the opposite. Rich, poor, poor, rich, alive, dead. It's kind of shocking and humbling. Even maybe humiliating isn't too strong of a word. Our self-awareness is perhaps not what we think it is. He wants us to know that the things he has against us are genuine. And he does have things against his churches. That's crystal clear from these texts. Five of these seven churches. He literally says, listen, I know you. And this is something I need to see you change. Sometimes we have the idea that Jesus accepts us just as we are, and that's the end of the story. Jesus accepts us just as we are, but then he calls us to grow, to change. In Romans chapter 8, we read to mortify the sins of the flesh. How many times have you used the word mortify in the last week? Anybody? See, there's the problem with old translations of the Bible. We don't use that word, and so that phrase doesn't ring in our ears as often. Put to death the sins of the flesh. That's what mortify means. You see, Christ has called us to a holy war, as the old Puritan Bunyan would put it. 
and we war against the sins of our own flesh. And that is what brings us to this great theme in Christ's preaching to Revelation. You see, all of these, all of these sermons of Jesus Christ begin with, I know you. All of them end with, to him who conquers. There's a sense in which all of Christ's sermons, all of his messages to each of his churches is a call to conquer. A call to conquer. How often do you think of your life as a life in which you are to be victorious? I want to give you a little brief word study that hopefully will be useful to bring this to mind regularly. We don't use the word mortify a lot, so that doesn't ring too many bells. But how many of you are wearing Nikes this morning? Anybody here wearing Nike shoes? I got Nikes. Got some Nikes over here. Did you know Nike is a Greek word? Do you know that it means conquer? And it shows up in the scriptures. We are more than conquerors. Uper Nikon. We are called to conquer. That's our word, Nike. And I want you, whenever you see sporty shoes or see that Nike swoosh, I want you to think about this. God has called you to victory. God has called you to overcome. God has called you to win. And that brings three questions to mind immediately. We already understand that these churches are really a basket case. You know, these churches are, one thinks it's alive, but it's dead in a doornail. One thinks it's rich, and they're poor as church mice. The other thinks it's poor, they're rich. Some of them are dealing with false teachers. Some of them are dealing with wild sexual immorality being, being accepted. Some are dealing with persecution and struggling with maintaining a witness. They don't want to talk about Christ, apparently. None of these churches are the churches we want other people to think we are. All of these churches are at the end of the day like us. As uh, the great football commentator would put it, stumbling, bumbling, and fumbling. <laughs> we are all a bunch of Christians who are, by grace, trying to, uh, with not just faltering but tripping steps, maintain course and direction towards Christ. And we are called to be conquerors. How many of you have ever seen the movie Bad News Bears? <laughs> Bad News Bears is a movie I like. It's, like a, it's about a bunch of, bunch of real misfits, a bunch of kids that you'd never think they could win a baseball game, and they win their Little League championship. And it's a great movie if you ever want to watch it, but there's a sense in which we cannot help but look at the work God has done throughout redemptive history and see that really... All the bad news bears is, is a muted, redemptive echo of that theme. Look at what Jesus did with a group of 12 apostles, whom he called slow to believe, hard of hearing, stubborn. Look at what he did with those 12 men who followed him for three years and still didn't understand over and over and over again. That's the theme. Look at what he did with a church that he had to send persecution, according to the book of Acts, in order to get them to leave Jerusalem and obey his great commission. Look at what Jesus does in the lives of people like you and me. You see, at the end of the day, it's no different than what God does with a man like Samson, who has a tremendous weakness for women, at least one in particular. What he does with a man like Jacob, who is an inveterate professional liar and trickster. What he does with a man like Joseph, who is hated by his brothers, thrown into prison and enslaved. What he does with someone like Moses, who is slow of speech and reluctant to serve. You see... The scriptures are full of God taking a roster of bad news bears and making a championship team. 
The scriptures are full of accounts of God taking the unlikeliest sorts and making them victors, conquerors. And that's what he calls us to. Whether we are the church who's described as weak, with very little gifts, or whether we are the church that is strong and has many gifts, whether we are the church that has great faith or are barely holding on, he calls all of his churches to conquer. How do we conquer? Over whom do we conquer? And why do we conquer? Are the three questions that I want us to ask together as we consider not just this one sermon of Christ, but all seven of them. How do we conquer? How do we, how do we conquer? Christ calls us to conquer, and we say, well, how do we do it? You know, we live the Christian life sometimes aimlessly, not realizing what it is exactly that we need to be doing in order to take the next step in our pilgrimage. And as we look at these seven churches, we see that the one who overcomes, as some translations put it, the one who conquers is the one who obeys Christ's word in that letter. And so what does he say in the letters? To the letter of Ephesians, he says, recover your first love and do the things you did at first. So one of the ways that we conquer is by remembering our passionate zeal and enthusiasm for Christ and going back to that simple message, that old, old story that we love to hear and tell, and reflecting on the gospel for us, and letting our hearts be kindled by the truth that God in Christ is our Savior, not just our Maker. That He is the lover of our souls, not just sovereign over our timelines. We overcome by living in the gospel. We overcome according to the church in Smyrna, by being faithful in hard times. The church in Smyrna is a church that was facing terrible, terrible persecution. It's one of two churches that is not rebuked by the Lord, but rather encouraged. And they are called by God to be faithful despite the persecution that is coming. To hold on. We overcome. We are conquerors when we do not let persecution knock us off of our witness, our testimony, our faith and confidence in Christ. Christ's sermon to the church in Pergamum, we learn that we are conquerors when we reject false teaching, when we recognize teaching that is not in accord with the gospel, that does not echo the great themes of Scripture that is out of step with redemptive history, that denies the God who is. And from the church in Thyatira, we learn that if we hold fast, if we hold fast to true teaching, despite the attractiveness and the pleasure offered by false teaching, we overcome. Resisting temptation. And you see, that's another side to resistance. On the one hand, don't let persecution make you stop doing what is right. Don't make persecution or popularity make you stop worshiping God publicly and privately. And then he says, he says that to the church in Sardis. And he says to the church in, in pardon me, he says that to the church of Smyrna, to the church in Sardis, he says, uh, in church in Thyatira, he says, do not let uh, the attractiveness of the forbidden fruit of this world and all of its idolatries and all of its immoralities make you go after sin. Hold fast to true teaching. This church in Sardis, you could say the one who overcomes is the one who does not soil their clothes. I still have a few names in Sardis. People have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. The one who conquers is the one who is consecrated and sanctified in Christ. The one who is actually alive and doesn't just have a false profession and empty words to say that they are Christian. The church in Philadelphia, keeping God's word for them means not to deny his name. 
the church in Laodicea, being a conqueror means to seek Christ, not to trust in yourself and to open the door of your heart. I want you to think about these pictures of conquering because all of them deal with you, your relationship to Christ, and your relationship to sin. And the one who conquers can be simply understood as the one who obeys Christ instead of self, instead of Satan, and instead of the world. So the one who conquers is the one who conquers in a sense, themself. By grace, through faith, all credit and glory go to God, who by His Spirit gives us a willing spirit to sustain us, who brings us conviction of sin, but nonetheless we are called as God's people in these sermons of Christ to wake up. We are called to repent, we are called to turn, we are called to recover, we're called to remember. And you see, the great obstacle in those things is really ourself, isn't it? Isn't the great obstacle to your repentance at the end of the day yourself? Because we love our sins. We love them. And that's why they are our sins. Have you ever stopped and pondered the truth? And it's a scary and it's a depressing and it's a horrible truth, but it's a truth nonetheless that we actually want to do the things that we do in some sense, at some level. And yes, there's a sense in which we echo with Paul in Romans 7, I do the things I don't want to do, but why are you doing them? You're doing them because there's still that remnant of the flesh that you have not yet mortified, Romans chapter 8. And you're following the cravings of the sinful nature. There's something in you that makes you want something that is wrong. And so you toy with forbidden fruit whether it's holding a grudge against your spouse, whether it's being vicious towards your kids, whether it's being crabby towards your neighbor, whether it's cursing in traffic on the 101, whether it's cheating on your taxes, looking at a computer website that you have no business even knowing. You know, these things happen, Christian. And we have to be men and women enough to recognize that Christ is calling us and commanding us to conquer those sins that cause us to falter, to get entangled, to trip, to stumble, to hurt ourselves, to wound others, to dishonor His name. He calls us to conquer. He calls us to conquer. Idolatry and immorality he calls us to conquer our cold hearts and our lazy hands. He calls us to conquer. And these are things that we bring to the table. And in Christ, we are more than conquerors. That's what Romans also tells us, does it not? And if we are in Christ and we abide in Him and we rest in Him and we trust in Him and we avail ourselves of His grace and the power that He gives us by His Spirit... There is not a one of us who can say, I, I, I want to repent, but I can't. We might fail in our repentance. A part of us might truly want to repent. But when we don't repent of our sins, it's because there's some love, some idolatry, that has raised its head, at least for a moment, as high as that of Christ's. And that's what sin is. Jesus Christ calls us to conquer. Conquering ourself, putting off the old man, being renewed by God the Spirit, and putting on the new is the way Paul describes it in Ephesians. That putting off, that mortifying, putting to death, that conquering, that's something that he calls us to do. And we are surrounded on the airwaves by devotional literature, by YouTube sermons, by the ones that get all the hits with this message coming from pulpits like this one, that you are great, you are worthy, you are who the Bible says you are, you are this, you are that. And I think too rarely do we as pastors say, you are called to change, to conquer, to overcome. And 
Jesus Christ himself gives you every armament, every piece of ammunition, every piece of military supply you might need in that spiritual fight. He is the one who is your captain, who gives the command, who knows the strategies, who gives you the strength. He is all of those things. But he never simply says to us, okay, your ticket's punched, now you can do whatever you want. You see, Jesus Christ doesn't say, go over there. He says, follow me. And Jesus Christ is on the move. And so are we. Following Him, step by step. Leaving comfort zones behind. Saying goodbye to pet sins. Giving away things that we know are not truly part of our personality, but something that we should shed as a snake leaves its skin behind. as we become more like Jesus. We're also called to remember that there is a Satan. Remember, in four of these seven letters, Jesus mentions Satan by name. And he knows that we live sometimes in places where Satan has his throne. Right? That's what he made very, very clear to the church in Pergamum. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. A center of pagan worship, a place where false worship and Caesar worship and and pagan gods, uh, Asclepius, worshipped in the form of a snake even, are worshipped and celebrated where you cannot participate in commerce unless you have some part of those feasts and those banquets and that false worship, which is the case in churches like Thyatira where the guilds ran the city. We've looked at these things and realized that it's hard to live a life of overcoming when Satan has authority. It's hard to do that when Satan is surrounding us with those sickly sweet whispers of the deep truths that give us the freedom to do whatever we want because we're Christians. Jesus warns the church about those who teach the so-called deep truths of Satan in his churches and lead his servants astray. Jesus says his servants. Jesus says they lead my servants astray. What a horrible thought. You see, Jesus wants us to understand that we have an enemy greater than ourselves. That we are, in a sense, born into this conflict between the seed of our first mother Eve and the seed of the serpent. And we should never forget that. That there is an enemy like a lion, roaring, prowling about, seeking to devour. We should never forget, dear friend, that acts of disobedience to Christ are acts of obedience to Satan. We should never forget that. And how often do I remember that? How often when I feel my anger start to flare up, or I feel that, that, that bile of sin cloud out my better judgment, how often do I stop to ponder the truth that what I'm doing is failing in that third great trial of Christ in the wilderness and I am bending my knee to Satan. You see, all of life is worship. And when we act with such radical, not just spiritual immaturity, but spiritual rebellion, we are honoring the enemy of our Savior. And we are called to overcome in Christ, even Him. And the world. John, the same disciple of Christ, the same apostle who writes this revelation at the end of 1 John, exhorts the churches to flee from idolatry because we know that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. And there's a sense in which we want so badly as Christians today for the world to like us, to appreciate us, to value us. To say, no, the church is important in society. The church does great things. The church puts roofs on orphanages in, in Uganda. The church has food barrels. The church does this. No, we respect the church. And I want to plead with you to consider that we are not called to be respectable in the eyes of the, the world. We are called to be obedient and faithful to Jesus Christ. And depending on what God is doing in the culture, the culture might respect us, they might despise us. But so often we as Christians 
try so hard to give sophisticated, nuanced answers to questions concerning things like hell or sexuality or abortion that we are like salt that's lost its savor. And we don't want to simply say, this is what the Bible says. Because we know the world will hate us. And dear friend, we're called to overcome the world. We're, over, we're called to overcome our flesh. We're over, in a sense, that's that great New Testament symbol of overcoming ourselves by the grace of God. To overcome uh, Satan, set free from fear of him. Um, told to, you know, we're, we're able to pray for deliverance from him. And in the Lord's Prayer, we're told how he will flee us if we resist him. We are told to overcome. And we're told to overcome the world. And the world, especially for you young people, I want you young people to look at me. The world wants you to be loved by the world. And there will come times in your life, and I know, Andrew, you've already experienced this, and you were strong and you, you held the line. You have to decide, I'm going to do what's right in God's eyes. I'm going to stand with a straight back, and I'm going to hold my head high as a child of God. I'm not going to compromise what I know to be true. And you need to do that over and over and over again. And we need to see a generation of Christians raised up who will be conquerors. Conquerors in the name of and for the sake of Christ. Who will overcome the sinful temptations that come up from and and desires within us and suggestions from without, we have to overcome that. We have to overcome that ancient enemy of the people. In Revelation, we're going to learn later that we overcome, we conquer Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. By the blood of the Lamb, the objective fact that Jesus died for us, the word of our testimony, our faithful, continual witness to His death and resurrection and the new life He's given us. We're called to overcome this world. Siding with Christ always, knowing that Christ plus one is always a majority and is unstoppable. We might be killed, but we will not be stopped. The worst thing anyone can do to us is end our earthly life. And that stops nothing at all. And I want you to think about the, the thing about Revelation that is so daunting and frightening to us. It presents us with this picture of our life that is, from the worldly perspective, surreal. Something other than real. It presents us with a picture of the church in which the church is a lampstand at the feet of Christ and he's standing amid his churches speaking to them through the ministry of his word and his person. Calling them to something that no one of these churches could dare to think they could do on their own. To become alive when it's dead. To act rich despite its poverty. To act spiritually poor despite its abundant material wealth. To stand firm even though they are a small oppressed minority in the face of persecution where they're told just bluntly by Christ that some would die. There's a sense in which God's word to us in Revelation, particularly these sermons of Christ addressed as churches, call us to live our life with such a heavenly mindedness that the things we do and say will not make sense to the world around us. And I have over and over and over again as a pastor, and I've worked at five different churches in five different states, in different capacities, of course. I've been a part of three different presbyteries, well, three and a half. And uh, I've seen over and over and over again our capacity to make decisions that are essentially exactly the decision we would make if we were a pagan franchise selling dream catchers. Where every decision we make is basically based on the things that we would learn from Madison Avenue and Wall Street. Where is that distinctive, courageous victory where is that desire to conquer, to overcome? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. You see, that's all we need. That's all we need. That's it. 
If we can overcome Satan himself that way, surely by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony and preaching the gospel to one another and to ourselves, we can overcome even our own sinfulness. We can be sanctified and grow. We can certainly overcome this world. This world which offers no hope but merely distraction. This world that offers no peace but only short-term pleasure. This world that will always leave a taint and a sting behind its sweetest enjoyments. I want to encourage you, dear Christian, to think why you should conquer. We conquer by being faithful to Christ, by remembering our first love, by being firm in persecution, by resisting immorality and idolatry, by coming to Christ for cleansing so that we might be alive instead of dead. We conquer in that conquering behavior and faith ourselves, Satan, and the world. Why do we do it? We do it for the great reward Jesus Christ offers those who conquer. And it is himself forever. I want to offer you a challenge. As I look out in this post-COVID room, I still see a lot of empty chairs. I want to offer you a challenge. I want to challenge you to invite someone here next Sunday who needs to hear about the reward of heaven. Next Sunday, the sermon from beginning to end is going to be about what Jesus Christ offers the one who overcomes. A new name, a white robe, food from the tree of life, a place on the throne. And there are an awful lot of people, people that we know and love dearly, who have never heard the gospel from us, and perhaps never heard the gospel from anyone. And if they were to die tomorrow, they would be separated from God forever, cast from His presence. I want to encourage you, bring someone. Bring someone tomorrow. Oh, pardon me, next Sunday. Tomorrow no one will be here. Don't do that. Next Sunday, bring someone. I am resolved. I am going to bring someone to church tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> on Sunday. <laughs> I'm going to bring some. I might drag them, but they will be here. Someone will be here. And I want to challenge you to do that. Make it a point. You know, I've often wondered about the paralytic brought by four people to Christ who couldn't go there himself. The Bible doesn't say anything about whether or not he was willing to go. When people were invited to come to the feast in the great parables of the Lord, some were just brought in off the streets, perhaps not knowing all the details, because others denied and said no. And I want you to be persevering. I want you to overcome any reticence you have. And I want you to think of someone and pray about someone who needs to hear an invitation to come to Christ and have heaven and hell set before their eyes. Uh, bring them. Will you try that? I'm asking honestly. I've asked before as a pastor. Will you try that? Will you try to bring someone? The gospel is that important, and this, dear friends, is how we overcome. And I want you to think about how you can actually apply sermons. I get a lot of feedback on my preaching, and a lot of people like it a lot. Some people hate it. But if it's not applied, I might as well go retire to Minnesota and write poems. Share the gospel. And if you don't feel comfortable sharing it yourself directly, the gospel is going to be preached next Sunday. The offer of heaven is going to be made as clear as I can make it. Bring someone. And let's overcome.
Are you with me? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Trying to be rough and make a moment here. <laughs> Christmas is coming. But so is heaven. And it grieves my heart every time a lacrosse season ends. And I know some of those boys I love so dearly don't know Jesus. I want you to feel that way about your coworkers, about your families, about your neighbors. I want you to do something about it. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the invitation, the command to overcome. I ask you to forgive me for being such a poor soldier so frequently. I ask you to forgive me for by being beaten and overwhelmed by my own sinfulness by the wiles of Satan when he outwits me, and by a desire to please the world. And Lord, these three constant and ever-present pressures so often cause us to be ineffective in our witness if we are even witnessing at all. And Father, I pray that you would give us the hearts of lions, even the heart of the Lion of Judah, that you would make us bold, that you would make us to be conquerors, victors, Lord, we don't simply want Nikes on our feet. We want Nikes on the brain. We want a heart that is Nikon. We want in Christ, from head to toe, from word to deed, to be those who overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Father, I pray that you would do a mighty work in us and through us. And that we might see our purpose on this world as being the fulfillment of the Great Commission to make disciples like Jesus to seek and to save the lost as we introduce them to the High King and invite them to conquer with us. Change us. Make it so, we beg you in Christ's name. If there are any here who have never been themselves conquered by Christ, that they might conquer with Him. God Almighty, show them their sin. Show them behind the curtain the fact that there is a Satan, and he desires nothing so much as the utter and eternal destruction of their soul. Miseries untold and unstoppable. And help them to hear in this invitation to come to Christ for forgiveness and for grace. A summons to shed that vile and polluted life and to be robed by the High King, the Lord of Glory, the Rose of Sharon, beauty indescribable, power unending. And Father, we pray that we would be different, heavenly, that we would be peculiar in the eyes of the world but that we would be a saving, healing, preserving influence wherever we go, whether it's our cubicle or lacrosse field, our neighborhoods, or a family table. These are our prayers in Christ's name. Amen.